Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Desmond. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> my uh, home group is uh, the Delta Group from Mount Botswana. I've just driven in. We got a little table over there and a whole lot of other Botswana people. Um, my sobriety date is the 28th of April 2006 and every single day after that. And uh, Most days are better than other days, but some days are bad and I go a bit crazy, but that's fine. And it's the, the thinking that gets me into trouble. It's, uh, yeah, it always gets me into trouble. And, uh, and all the other little triggers and all the things that I've learned along the way about resentments and, uh, and I got myself caught up short uh, two days ago. I worked from home and, um, and somebody had owed me uh, some money. And they still owe me the money, actually, but that's fine. And uh, I was walking along, and my head just suddenly spun out of control within a nanosecond, and it was that, I can't even say it, because this thing over here is going to spike. I was cursing that person, and I was, and, and apart from cursing that person, nothing was right. I was looking around me, and absolutely everything around me was a complete fuck-up. And I knew that, and I said, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And I was getting better already. And that's taken me years to do that, to reach out for those tools and use them, and use them, and wake up in the morning and say my serenity prayer. And when I forget to say my serenity prayer, and I'm an atheist, and when I forget to pray, when I forget to humble myself, when I forget to reach out for those tools that I've picked up and learnt through my friends in AA and through the readings and through everything else, my sanity comes back and it stays and that's wonderful. So how does, how do I, I'm talking on pretty much the same thing that Chris is talking on. So I could have got up here and said ditto and sat down again, <laughs> but I think that's a bit of a cop out. Um, came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Well, who the hell is anybody to say that I'm not sane? This initial response and curse and how the hell and damn them and all that sort of stuff until I realized that almost everything that I did and every way I behaved, and it wasn't so much my presentation. I'm also in the hospitality industry, been in the hospitality industry for 29 years. Um, so I'm an actor. Anybody in here else an actor? A bullshitter? Anybody else? <laughs> um, and it was just amazing. I could step, I could be foul, foul inside and step outside and smile and say, Hi, welcome. How nice to see you. Jeez, it's been forever. How are you? And turn on and say, asshole. And all the other things that come with the territory. And that was it. And I learned. I learned. I'm a fantastic actor. I was really good at um, what I do. I'm still good at it, but I don't practice uh, hospitality anymore. Well, not that, not professionally anyway. Um, and I was good at it. And uh, I work in a particular industry in northern Botswana where um, we would deal with luxury lodges all in. For $1,000 a night, you can stay at the lodge and you get all your drinks. And uh, I get to sit at the table with you. Would you like some more wine? Would I? I would love some more wine. To, a nightcap, perhaps, and keep it going, keep going. And that's kind of how I got out of control and got myself into a great degree of trouble with uh, alcohol. But it didn't start there. It started way back with the fear. That I remember, and I was sitting at the table early and thinking, and it always goes back further and further. I must have been five or six when that knot, that core, of, of fear that has got that, it, there's no reason for it. It's baseless, completely baseless, but it exists. Why are you looking at me like that? Why are you talking? Why are they laughing? All that sort of stuff from little, little, smaller than these two kids over here who've also come down with us from Botswana and who are very grateful that their mom is an alcoholic as well. 
And growing out of that, as I said, I grew up in a, I used to wear cassocks and go to church and sing in the choir and uh, all those sort of things and grew to dislike the church for various lies that were told to me, that were told to my family about um, about peace and love and all sorts of things. And there was just too much hypocrisy and I grew to really hate and despise and throw contempt on that. And it was amazing how much, as I carry poison, that I'm tossing out at everybody else, how I'm just breathing it all in myself and poisoning myself and becoming more and more vitriolic within as much as I'm spewing it out at everybody else and having to learn to let that go. Um, spirituality, growing spirituality. Um, on the way down with uh, Blair, Blair and I shared an interesting 12 hours in the vehicle today. Um, listening to half talks, because for some reason, all of the talks that I have cut off halfway through. But that's fine. Some, maybe mine will as well tonight. I don't know. But um, it, one of the things is about made a decision to turn our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Now, that phrase, as we understood Him, was one of the things that really, really caught me, being an atheist. I mean, how I understand God and how anybody else here understands God, that's their business. And how I understand God, well, that, that appeals to me because I could make up whatever I wanted to believe in could be my God or Goddess or God with a small g or God with a big g or all the letters in bold. doesn't matter. It's my God. And if, as long as it's a good God, then that's fine. And that's kind of how I started to deal with it. And one of the talks that we listened to tonight was um, about building spirituality, and the, the, the talk is about made a decision. So we made a decision three weeks ago to come down to this meeting. That's all we did. This morning, we took action. We got into the car. And that's the same, building my spiritual relationship with my God. And, and in building that relationship with my God, I build a relationship with myself, and I build a relationship with other people. I become a lot nicer than I am. I'm not, I, I, I don't trade, I, a little bit. I, I don't trade in bullshit as much as I used to, um, which can get me into trouble because I kind of open my mouth in inappropriate times and say things which um, are honest, but they can be hurtful. And then you go to the step that says, unless to do so would cause more harm than good. And I've, I'd have to bite my tongue. Um, so spiritual growth. It's um, it's every moment, and it's being conscious. The Buddhists refer to it as mindfulness, being mindful. What are we doing? What am? It's not about we. Mindful. It's about me. What am I doing? There was another talk that I listened to a little while ago, um, where the person was uh, said, uh, "So how have you treated the world today?" He said, "Surely you mean how has the world treated me?" He said, I don't care how, you, how the world treated you. How are you treating the world? And that comes back again for me, back to spirituality. Because actually, what anybody else does is what they do. And it's what I do. It's how do I build? How do I reach out to a God of my understanding? And as I said, I'm going to reiterate it. I'm an atheist. But I'm a very spiritual person. And I do pray. And the more I pray the better I get at living. The calmer I become, the more sensible I become. My son loves me a whole lot more, and our kids love us. Um, but God bless him. <laughs> He's a Christian. That's what gets me. He loves going to church. He's just up for it. But uh, he'll come to me in the morning when I'm taking him to school or telling him to go to school. Because some mornings are like that. <laughs> um, He'll say, are you going to a meeting today? And there's this look of hope <laughs> on his face to please go to a meeting because I'm sitting with these crazy people that are all alcoholics over there and because we are honest when we get it and we are honest with ourselves, never mind, honest. am I honest with you? I don't know. If I'm honest with myself, then I've got to be honest with you. And because we're honest in our meetings, 
I come out of that meeting not walking on a cloud, but just feeling calmer and more at peace. And I get home and my son looks at me with, and he just hugs me because he's so much happier. And that's, that's a reward. That's a reward for my spiritual growth as well. Um, <clears throat> the um, contempt prior to investigation. There's another discussion we had. Well, 12, 12 hours in a car is a long time to sit next to somebody like Blair who doesn't shut up, by the way. <laughs> um, and it's a very, very important thing because, um, yeah, I grew up in a Christian household. My parents are Christian. My mom still goes to church having seven times a day. She folds cassocks. She does, makes things for the church. She loves her church. Absolutely adores her religion as she understands it. And that's her God. And she's really happy that I have found my God as I understand him. She's really, really happy because she has, for the first time, I was down visiting, she lives in Cape Town. <clears throat> I think I moved to Botswana to get away from her, actually. <laughs> but she, um, the day that I was leaving, she said, I don't recall ever seeing you as happy as you are now. And that's what AA has done for me. Why? I don't know. How? I have no idea. We've discussed this often in our group as well. How does it work? We've no idea how it works. How does praying every day or saying the serenity prayer help? I have no idea. Is it reaffirmation? Is it reminding ourselves of, our, of, our, of, our, of, uh, of how vulnerable we are? My, my, my girlfriend drinks. She... Um, She's cheap to run. She has two glasses and she says, whoa, stop. <laughs> which, is, which is a source of amusement. And she gets, if she has three glasses, because there's a major celebration going on, she might have three glasses. She starts to get guilt. And it's that, that guilt annoys the hell out of me because my issues are my issues. My alcoholism is my alcoholism and it's got absolutely nothing to do with how much she drinks because it's terrible that she can only drink two. I mean, what's the point of only having two glasses? Um, I remember the resentments and the hatred I used to have towards my son. And that used to scare the hell out of me. That, And I didn't know it scared me, but I used to get really pissed off because I'm divorced. Um, and I have custody. Um, I don't think the courts knew I was an alcoholic. But I have custody. And um, Wednesdays is Max goes to his mum, and uh, every second weekend. And uh, <coughs> Monday and Tuesday was horrible for Max. Wednesday was better because I was helping him pack his bags because he was going to his mum. And then I'd, his mum would come and pick him up or I'd drop him off at his mum. And then straight after work, <laughs> you know which shop I went to, huh? It wasn't pep stores, that's for sure. That was where I went, and it was normally, it was, you know, cheaper by the gallon, huh? and um, and sit by myself. The cheaper the wine, the more you get. That's how it works. I think most of us know that rule. Huh? Um, we also know that if you've got 17 Rand 50 or an Algebraith, 17 Pula 50, I knew exactly how many drinks I could get for 1750, and actually, if I took that brand, I could get four. Three, and I've changed. And that's how I used to work it. Um, and those were my spirits. That's the spirituality that I believed in, the spirits of alcohol. Um, how it worked? Well, I think, you know, my body and my brain, I know. I was always searching oblivion. That's what I always wanted. That's what I always wanted. I mean, as the stories come out, then alcohol certainly was my drug of choice. But there's a litany of things. And uh, as we go in meetings, I can't believe how many drugs I've taken that I forgot about. And <laughs> they come out in humorous ways, and we can, I can laugh at it now. They were never a threat for me, because it just alcohol is so much nicer, so much better, it's so much more available, so much more accessible. I don't have to go hide anywhere to go and buy a bottle or three or a case, whatever the case, uh, it, it might be. I didn't have to go and see a merchant. It was easier. So it was more accessible. And it's acceptable to drink. Certainly in my industry, it's very acceptable to drink. It's part of what we do. We're entertainers, apart from anything else. Um, and then I, um, 
I started to have a little nervous breakdown. I had a, I, yeah, I had a traumatic childhood. I had all sorts of things from an alcoholic father and alcoholic grandmother. Both of my uh, uncles are alcoholics. So I've got this whole history of alcoholism in my family. Um, I wasn't an alcoholic. I just used to drink a lot. Um, and then I started to get the shakes and um, I went to the doctor and he said, no, it must be anxiety. So flick me some of those and take some of those. And uh, that mixed with wine um, and still wake up going, ah! At two o'clock in the morning, thank God I had the sense to leave half a gallon of wine in the fridge to calm me down again. And then I started to really have a breakdown, so I went to rehab. And, um, and that helped. 28 days of therapy, five and a half hours a day of working. And if you take that out, that's two years of seeing a psychologist jammed into 28 days. And um, I came out of it, and the pink cloud was uh, was great. And... One day I went in to have a cup of coffee at Mug and Bean. I was down in Johannesburg on business, into the smoking section, and uh, lit a cigarette and uh, said, I'd like to have a uh, glass of Sauvignon Blanc, please. <laughs> like that. I was going for a cup of coffee. I was going for a cup of coffee. And that evening we went out for sushi, and sushi and that other dual syllable, sake, they go together. And then it was sake. And then two years later it was... Uh, my God, what am I doing? This is not my life. This is not the life that I'm meant to live. I didn't want to wake up in bed with this dear friend of mine, who's still a very dear friend of mine. She's now in India at the moment. She's on a yoga retreat. But I didn't want to wake up in bed because we're mates. We're not lovers. But apparently we were. Um, and that's the thing. Was I having a good time? No, I wasn't having a good time. Well, maybe, but I didn't remember. And that was always the issue. Do I remember? Did I? No. But I, apparently I was always lucid. I was always talking and I was funny. Apparently my eyes used to close. But I'd still be able to have a conversation. <laughs> and, um, and that was the 28th of April 2006. I woke up and I said, that's it. And I white knuckled it for four years. I had this. I had the big book. And... Um, just over two years ago, we had a, a, a retreat in Maun. And that was pretty much the first time that I actually really opened the big book and, and listened. Because prior to that, all I could hear were these voices in my own head. These condemnations, these, these, these less than, slower than, fatter than, whatever. There were a million reasons why I was not good enough, why I couldn't, why I... And, uh, and I started to grow from that day. And, uh, and that's when I started to actually pray. And that's when that circle of, of friendship is just so powerful. At the end of the meetings, even we refer to it as the little Girl Scout thing, when we, uh, finish, the <laughs> when we finish the serenity prayer. And... Uh, how does spirituality grow? It grows through practice. It grows through action. It grows through, you don't have to believe it. You just got to do it. That's, that's the weird thing about it. Is that, okay, God grant me the serenity. Any of you ever done that? <laughs> and then one day, it's, there's a smile. And it's easy. And when I see people... And I've got to get back to say I rather than we because it's about my perception on it. And when I get out there and I see a person and I don't have a knot of fear, it still comes back very occasionally, that little anxiety. But I see people and I say, I, I want to see them. I want to be with them. I'm not running away from them anymore. Um, There's also the other weird thing about alcohol is it's a depressive and I have a melancholy, I tend towards melancholy, so I take a depressant to help my melancholy. Never got that. Never, I, I understand it now. Because it wasn't the melancholy, it was the oblivion that I was seeking, because I wanted to shut it down. But the more I pray to a God that I don't know, that scientifically has never been proven, and all that sort of good stuff, but the more I pray, and the more I hand over and let go and stop trying to control my, it myself. 
the calmer I become, the more I enjoy life, the more I laugh, the more my son is prepared to give me stick. And the more I see those little, those bad moments in him that I see are me. And I realize that I've got to pray more. And the more I pray, the more I seem to play. And the more fun I have. And I say it again. How it works? No idea. Why it works? No idea. But I do it. And sometimes I'm not as good as I should be at doing it. And two weeks later I'm in a funk. And I realize I haven't been doing my prayers. I haven't been saying my mantras. I haven't been practicing. And the more I practice it, the better I get at living. And it's taken me a long time. I'm closer to 50 than to 40. So time is running out. But it's still another 30 or something years. I don't know how many years to go still. And the more I practice by praying and reaching and, and growing spiritually, I'm convinced that I'm going to enjoy my life a lot more as I do now. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Freya. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Santon Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not going to tell you my sobriety date. It was a bit, quite long ago. Um, I just have a, a special request, and I hope you don't take um, you don't take average. But Scott, could we light the candle? I do it at the end. Okay, great. It's always lovely. It gets cold, but it's, it's always so lovely to have to have a lit candle. And I also, I wonder why is everybody so far away? Are you scared of us? We're not going to do anything. We, we really, you know, we, we really we also elkies, you know. Maybe we're scared of you. Anyway, I have been asked. I, I didn't know I was going to be speaking, so it was it was a bit of a surprise. I'm going to do my best, and I was told to talk about uh, there is a solution. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I, I, um, I came up with Jan from Johannesburg and we had a lot of chatting in the car and, and it was great. And, um, I said to him, you know, I, I really had a very good childhood. I had a fantastic childhood. I wasn't one of those people who started drinking when they were 12 or 11 or 15 or whatever and that kind of thing. Drinking wasn't like that for me. Um, I, I went through school, through varsity. Uh, my dad was an alcoholic. I didn't know it. I think he did it quite well. Uh, he never hit my mother. We were not really in an alcoholic household. But I've since discovered most of my other family, my aunts and uncles, were raving lunatics. But anyway, um, I identify with the with the uh, the industry that you guys were in. I was in the same industry, also as a conference organizer, as a, a coordinator, as a owned a hotel at one stage. In, in the Cape, lived in Botswana, lived in Zambia, had both my kids in Zimbabwe, so I've been around, but I'm a Hollander. Not that that makes any difference. <laughs> um, I started to drink alcoholically um, when I discovered I'd, I was already married and I'd had my first child and I had a, a started to have terrible bouts of insomnia. And up until that time, I'd, I did... I did drink. I did. I, I, we had a great time at Varsity. We, we had parties. We, um, you know, I, I, I got my degree. I worked for a school of art. All the kids were my age, and we jawled, and we. It was lovely. I had a really, really. I had lots of friends. I lived in Hillbrow for four years, right next door to the Moulin Rouge Hotel, where there was a superb little pub down at the bottom. It was fantastic. I had great fun. Hillbrow, Hillbrow was great in the 70s. It really was fabulous, and I had no problem with alcohol. I still think that at that time I hadn't crossed the line. I still think that for me there was a line that I had to cross and that line came when I started to use alcohol for the, for the wrong reason. Alcohol is meant to be used as a social lubricant to, to maybe help people to feel less, well for me certainly it made me feel less shy. Um, I was a very shy person when I'd had a few drinks. I only discovered this when I got married the first time. My, my husband, now my ex-husband, was always the life and soul of the party. You know, at the Marshalls, there were always parties. And if you lived in Zim or anywhere up there, Malawi, whatever, Botswana, uh, we lived in Sleepy Pikwi for some time, all the households had a bar, 
And, um, you know, every Sunday, everybody was at the Marshalls. You bring something to eat, and it's open bar, bring your own booze, big gardens, big parties, lots of servants. We were, you really, we lived a beautiful colonial life, and it was great. But I, my husband was the life and soul of the party, and he was Mr. Popularity. And I wasn't, unless I had a drink. Then I felt I could talk to, to people, and I could socialize, and I could, you know, I could... It was great. I felt good and I felt prettier and my legs didn't feel so thin and I didn't, my tummy didn't feel so fat and, you know, somehow things were better and it was, it was, it was nice. It was lovely. And for a long time it was fine. It was great. We lived a beautiful life there and I, I like I said, I had a wonderful childhood. My parents doted on us and, and looked after us and really, really, I, I, I can't, I can't say that bad things started to happen that early. But I started, somebody said to me once, a lady, I can't remember who it was, said, you know, if you can't sleep at night, um, she said, you know what I do? I just get a little tot of brandy and I just drink it down and then I go to sleep and it's great and it works. Why don't you try it? And I even discussed it with my husband. I said, you know, this is what they say. Maybe, maybe I'll sleep better. Because I used to walk the house at night and I couldn't sleep and this was the babies and it was, and, and, you know, it, it, it wasn't really, that was the problem for me. And I started with my little, my husband even bought me a special little glass. He used to pour it for me every night with my little brandy. And I would sleep lovely and it would be great. And then it wasn't long before I would have to have two little brandies. And that's when I crossed the line. And that's when alcohol became my problem. And up until that time, alcohol had been my solution. And we're talking here, I have lied, geez, I was being asked to talk about there is a solution. And that was, alcohol was for me a long time the solution to my shyness, the solution to my, my social uh, inequality and, and inability to, to, to um, entertain people. My husband was in an important position and we had to, you know, always be uh, part of, the, like I say, life and soul of the party. And that was not in my nature. I'm not that kind of person. But alcohol made me that kind of person. And so alcohol was a solution for me for a long time. It worked really well. I was popular. I was, I was, I was naughty, especially when I lived in Hilborough. I was very naughty. Because all my inhibitions were taken away, and I, I didn't worry. I wasn't staying with my parents. I was on my own. Hilbra was fab, and and alcohol was the solution to to my shyness, and it worked so fantastically well that it it, it carried on a long time until long after I was probably thirty four, thirty five, when I started to have this insomnia problem. And it wasn't all that long before I was waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And my husband always likes to say, you know, alcoholics don't just wake up like normal people. They skrkwakr. You know, they, like, I think you mentioned it is. And um, I used to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and my only solution then to go back to sleep, because now I'm scared I'm not going to sleep, and then I will be tired the next morning, and who's going to look after the babies, and blah, 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 blah. I would sneak down stairs very quietly and softly and have myself another little drink. And then so that I wouldn't make any noise and alert anybody, I would just drink it out the bottle, because it, you know, it makes noise to pour stuff in a glass. So I'd drink it out the bottle. And, and the line was already crossed then for me, but I didn't know there was something wrong with me. But I, I started to use alcohol more and more, and it was for me it was it was quite quick. It was pretty quick. It was ten years of of a spiral, of a really really dizzy, frightening spiral. I found myself at one stage in a hospital in in Harare um, for depression, depression, and I was having withdrawal symptoms. I didn't know it at the time. I know it now. I was hearing voices, I was seeing things that weren't there, I was hearing music that wasn't playing, I was pe hearing people speaking in funny languages. It was weird, and I, I remember it well, and nobody understood what was wrong. Nobody mentioned alcohol, nobody said you drink too much, nobody, you know, I don't think people knew what I was doing during the night. And eventually I got to the stage where in the morning I would get up to breakfast and I would be shaking and I... And my husband then knew by that time already that to stop the shakes, he would just have to give me another little glass of brandy, which is what he did. I mean, he aided and abetted me and enabled me right. I mean, I'm not blaming him. He didn't know. 
because he drank a lot, he still drinks a lot, he's my ex-husband, he still drinks a lot, but he's not the kind of person who cannot stop. He can stop. I found I'd crossed the line to the stage where I could not stop, because if I stopped, I had withdrawal symptoms. And the only solution to the withdrawal symptoms was to have another drink. And I was terrified of the, of the withdrawal because, they, because the withdrawals were bad. They were frightening. They were terribly frightening. And, I, and, and I, to see, uh, I saw insects crawling out of the walls over my bed. And, you know, I spent one night totally wide awake with my husband trying to protect me from all these big spiders that wanted to climb over me. I mean, it was, it was a terrible, terrible time. And it went, I went down very, very fast. And we moved, um, actually from, um, Harari, and I actually, in, in Harari, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous once. My husband said, maybe you should try Alcoholics Anonymous, so I'm not going with you, it's your problem, not mine. So off you go, cheerio, and I went there, and I met all these people, I didn't understand what they were talking about, I didn't know that I had a problem, I knew nothing about alcoholism, and I went once or twice, nobody ever said anything to me, nobody gave me a book, or anyway, I didn't understand what was going on, so I left it, and then my husband, um, in his wisdom, <laughs> bought a little country hotel in the Cape Winelands, and we moved there. And it was it was fantastic. It was uh, we had a little 34 bedroom hotel, was 100 years old, in Robertson in the Cape, in the middle of the Winelands, and you know everybody drank, and and the bar was the big central meeting place, and and I used to sit and drink in that bar. I would drink nicely like a lady, you know, have a glass of Van Lover and wine. It was very cheap there, and it was fantastic, and entertain the people, and play a few games. I was captain of the ladies' pool team, and the whole story it was, it was fantastic. But I used to go home, leave my husband in the pub. I used to go home at 10, 11 o'clock to sleep, because I had to get up early to fetch the monk, and I'd have a bottle at home to make me sleep. And and it got so bad, I actually, my, my husband eventually sent me to Stickland in Cape Town, I'm a rehab junkie, like a lot of my compatriots here. I was sent to Stickland in Cape Town, which is a rehab, and um, I was actually sent there twice. The second time, my husband had me committed as a, at the state president's pleasure, which actually means that you you move in there and that's where you stay because it's a loony man. You know, you're insane when you go there. Anyway, I didn't know that that's what it was. I... I um, they, you know, the nurses go through your suitcase and they search everything and they take out and they, they were talking to each other. They were ignoring me completely. And they said, shame, you know, this, this girl, she's got nothing on her, but she's going to be here the rest of her life. And I thought, oh, what the hell are they talking about? And I asked them and they told me, I said, you are here to stay. This is not a rehab. This is a, it's a prison. It's, anyway, it was a huge shock to me. I didn't know that. And that night, they, they locked me up in a cell, probably one of the lowest points of my life, but wasn't quite my rock bottom, with no clothes, with a mattress that stank of urine, no toilet, kept the light on all night. I cried and screamed the whole night. They wouldn't let me out. It was the most terrible night, one of the most terrible nights of my life. I'll never forget it. And after a week, I got out of that rehab. I had to go and see the psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said to me, Mrs. Holmes, I was in Mrs. Marshall, we can't keep you here because you are not, not insane. According to our, he didn't say that. According to our specifications, you are not insane. But of course, alcoholically, I was insane. But I didn't still know that yet. Anyway, I, I came out of there and I was on the streets of Cape Town. I had no money. My husband refused to come and fetch me. And I eventually had to phone the barman, who was a buddy of mine. He came in his old rattle trap all the way from Robertson to come fetch me. By that time, I had been kicked out of the business. And I decided to go back to my I had my two little children then. I decided to go back to my mother in Boxburg, which I did. And uh, then I would come right, and I would get my kids back, and everything would be fine. I would get a job. And I came back, and my husband divorced me, and he got custody of the children. And... That was quite correct because I was, I, I was a mess. And there's no ways I could have looked ever after these two little children, a little a boy and a girl. And he got, got a court awarded in custody, so that was the end of that. I lost my kids. And um, I was three weeks in Boxburg with my mother, and I was already going up to the local bottle store, and I used to have this big handbag, and I used to buy these little screw-top wine bottles. 
and put them all in his handbag and, you know, and, but to get rid of them was another problem. I mean, at one stage of my life, the only thing that worried me was where am I going to get my next drink and where am I going to hide the empty bottle? And you, the, 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 the lengths I went to to hide those bottles, you have no idea. I would drive miles out into the bush and, and throw them behind a tree and make sure nobody was looking and, you know, really insane, stupid things. Anyway. Um, to cut a long story short, I ended up in, in, a, in a rehab in Boxburg, and I got sober there, and there I met a man, and I thought I was in love, and we went off, and he was still drinking, and, and we bought a restaurant in Standerton, and there I had, I tried to commit suicide eventually. Because he was drinking, when he was drinking, I was running the restaurant, when I was drinking, he was running the restaurant, and I was stealing all the booze, the wine out of the fridge, and I had a special key mate, so I could go in the back door in the middle of the night, and it was just, it was crazy, it was crazy, crazy, crazy. But I knew I had a problem. And um, I, I eventually, I was in, um, I tried to commit suicide, and they put me in the hospital in, in Standerton. And, you know, don't do that, because in the first place, trying to commit suicide is not funny. It didn't work. I didn't do it right. And they put you in the hospital, and they ignore you, because they don't like you. You try to take your own life. It's not right, you know. You, you just... They just leave you there, and it's terrible. Anyway, eventually they transferred me to Vescopis in Pretoria, where I stayed for six weeks, and I wanted to live there forever. I felt so safe. I felt that I couldn't drink, and I had, I had my own little room there, and I was fine. I wanted to get a job and stay there forever. My mother didn't even come to see me. At this stage, I had lost everything. Now, looking at alcohol as a solution, you, you get solutions that wipe everything out. And this solution, alcohol, had wiped everything out of my life. My mother, my father, my sisters, my brother, my kids, my husband, my business, my car, my job. I literally had nothing left except this Vescopis where I'm now staying, which is also a bit of a crazy, insane place. But actually, I was actually very happy there. I actually loved rehabs. I, I was very good at rehab. I loved it every time. Anyway, I came out of there. Got into another crazy situation, still not realizing that, you know, there are, there are, I have to make a plan. I'm, I'm, I'm screwing everything up. I'm, I just was such a mess. It was just such hell. It was such hell, and I didn't know. I did not know what to do. But, you know, funnily enough, I'd been to, to Alcoholics Anonymous in Robertson, where I lived, but there were only three members. I was the fourth member. The other one, one of the ladies, the only thing we talked about was Nas Buerta. <laughs> he was like the big thing in those days, you know. And I, I wasn't much of a rugby person, and I, I thought Nas Water was okay, and he was good, and there was lacquer, but I didn't get anything out of the meeting. So eventually, I bought all the books. I didn't read any of them. And um, there is a chapter in the book, by the way, and I just wanted to say, Des, thank you for your share, because you told us you didn't know how it works, and then you proceeded to tell us how it works. So, and there is actually a chapter in the book that says how it works. So um, I, I got all the literature, but I didn't read it. And when I left that group, I thought, this is not an AA group. This is a nice Porter group. They can have all the books, and I'm going. So, so we left. And um, cut a long story short, I eventually, after a series of rehabs and relapses, I, I managed to, I was working, the first job I managed to get in Pretoria after I got out of West Corpies was, funnily enough, as a barmaid. But I had to have a job because I had no money. I had nobody supporting me, and I had to get a job. And I walked into the – this proto hotel's closed now. But I walked into there, and I said to the manager, you have to give me a job. And he said, why? I said, because I need a job, and I'm good at this, and you have to give me the job. And he gave me the job. He told me later on that he only did it because I said he had to. But anyway, and I was sober in that job for quite some time. And then I was offered another job as a barmaid at a better hotel, a new hotel up in, in – uh, in Centurion, in the Centurion Lake Hotel, which had just been built, and I was the barmaid there, and in my in-between days, I worked in the restaurant, and I didn't drink, and, and it was great, it was fine. And I had one relapse there, but I managed to, to drag myself out of that by myself. And then I decided, I was living at that stage with my sister, and I decided then, you know, everybody's saying to you, I'm afraid you've got a degree, and you've got all this education, and here you're working as a barmaid, what's wrong with you, you know, sort yourself out. And I applied for a job at the Valley Lodge in, in Michalisburg as a conference coordinator. And I totally lied my way into that job. I applied, and they said, send your CV. I said, no, I can't send my CV. I've got a fax machine. I'll bring it to you. 
I borrowed a dress of my sister's because I had no clothes. And I went, I took a day off and I drove to Valley Lodge and I took my CV and I told them I'd owned a hotel and I'd run all these conferences. I mean, I never ran. I ran a couple of pool competitions, but I never ran a conference. But anyway, I got a job. And, and it was a super job, and I was sober in the job, and I was living there. They got me a cottage, and I, I was this lovely office, beautiful four-star hotel, really fantastic. And I, I was very good at what I did. I was very good. And I did that for four years. But, you know, by, by this time, my husband had moved to Zimbabwe, and he'd taken my children. And uh, I did nothing I could do about it. He had custody, and he took them without telling. He said they were going on holiday, just because he knew I could get a lawyer to stop him. But anyway, I didn't know that. And um, I went up one year to go and see my kids, and I came back. It was Christmas, and my, my sobriety date happens to be the 1st of January. I got back to Joburg on the 31st of December, and they were having a, a dance at the hotel where I worked. And I, there was something wrong with me. I don't know what it was. It was almost I hadn't had any booze for a long time. But what I did do was over Christmas when the people were, when we were having Christmas dinner, one of the guys made a lot of brandy butter, and I found myself one night at 2 o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I was sitting in front of the fridge in a chair eating the brandy butter. And, the, you know, it, it was, it, to this day I still say I will not eat food with brandy in because that turned me totally crazy, just the brandy and the brandy butter. So I came back to Joburg, and, and there was something wrong. I was as if I was in the biggest hangover I'd ever been in. And I went to the doctor, and he said, oh, your blood sugar's low, and put me on a drip, and the whole story. But I felt, you know, I couldn't sit down, I couldn't lie down, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't walk, I couldn't. I said to my boss, please, can I work tonight? I don't know what to do with myself. And she said, it's fine. You put your uniform on, come and help with the, with the, with the dance and everything, which I did. You can sleep at the hotel, and tomorrow morning you can, you can start work. And that night, everybody went home. And, you know, I don't understand people who don't drink properly, you know, you leave a half a bottle of wine on the table, come on, you know, what's wrong with you? And uh, But I hadn't had a drink for, for quite some time, but I wasn't in AA. And the solution this time to my to this terrible hangover experience I was having was to go back to the venue where the, where the, the dance had been, and there was a half a bottle of red wine, and it just showed me the progression of this disease. I drank not even all that red wine, and I blacked out. And I woke up the next morning, 9 o'clock, and I was, my face was swollen like this. I was sweating. You could smell the alcohol on me. It was the most dreadful, dreadful experience. <laughs> Luckily, one of the girls who lived there, her father was an alcoholic, and he had been sent to rehab. And they sent me to the same rehab in Kempton Park. And there I found the solution. There I, I, I knew now I had a problem. And I had been looking for a solution for a long time. And believe me, I went everywhere. I saw psychiatrists, psychologists, I went to priests, I went to counselors, I went to rehabs, I looked for the solution everywhere to get a solution to the solution that I'm now addicted to. And um, in this last rehab I was in, they, had, they made you write out, it wasn't an AA rehab, it was a CA rehab, which is a Christian Alcoholic Rehabilitation Center, but they make you write out some goals in your life. What are you going to do? What's your short-term goal? When you walk out of here, what's the first thing you're going to do? And the first thing I knew I had to do was to phone AA because I had made a decision. In this rehab, I was given a couple of hours of clarity in my mind to make a decision. Am I going to live or am I going to die? I wasn't even at a crossroads. I was at a T-junction. If you turn left, go drink, we'll kill yourself. You turn right, you've got a chance, you're going to live. And I, I chose to turn right. And I did everything that they asked me to the nth degree. And I wrote out pages and pages and pages of my resentments and all the things I did wrong right back to the time when I was sleeping around and when I was doing all kinds of things. Before I was even drinking alcoholically, everything I could possibly think of I ever done wrong to anybody or that I'd done wrong to myself, I wrote down. And I thought, shit, they're going to put me in prison when they read this. Because <laughs> I had actually broken into the house and stolen a bottle of wine. But anyway, I went into, I gave it all in, and I went into the therapist, and she just put a red pen through it and threw it away. <laughs> I thought, oh, well, there goes all my stuff. Anyway, I made the decision then. 
that I was going to do it. And the first thing I was going to do, I knew about Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, the first thing I'm going to do when I get out of here is phone Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's what I did. And I got a guy on the line. He said, yeah, it's fine. You can come. Where do you live? I said, Michalisburg. Oh, no meetings there. Come to uh, Rudaport. Meeting. This is the address. Such and such a time. And I went there. I didn't understand what they were talking about. It was a small group. They don't exist anymore. But, and for three months, I went every Wednesday night because I knew there was no other solution. The solution was here. I could see it in the faces of those people. I could see that they had the answer. I could see that they were sober. I could see that they were happy. I could see that they were in control. I could see that they had some measure of sanity. And the things that they said made, made sense. And I suddenly I could see that this is the solution. My solution today is just not to have that first drink and to go to a meeting. And I could only go, we only went once a week because it was quite far. And the people started saying to me, but oh, you come all this way from Achillesburg? Thanks. You come all this way from Achillesburg and, you know, is it worth it? I said, listen, you told me if, you, if I want what you've got, I must be willing to go to any length to get it. That's why I come every Wednesday night. I don't care if it's hails or snows or, you know, God is surely sitting in my back seat. That's what you told me. I'm only doing what you said. And that was my solution. And, and, and you know, rehab is a good thing. It's a re- rehab is a fantastic thing. Rehab is where I could stop drinking. But AA is where I, where the solution was to stay stopped forever, for today. Rehab is where they told me, I don't have to worry about tomorrow or Christmas or my birthday. Rehab and AA is where they told me, just stay sober one day at a time. Just get up in the morning, say, I'm not going to have a drink today. And then in the evening, say, thank God, I didn't have a drink today. And that was so simple for me. And then it was only recently I started to get into the big book. I've been in, around AA quite some time. When I did discover, there is a chapter that says how it works. And I read it. And now I, I know how it works for me. I know how this works for me. I, I get involved. I do service. I do what it tells me in the big book. I, I believe in a higher power. I've been searching for a higher power all my life in all kinds of churches. I found alcohol, uh, my higher power in Alcoholics Anonymous. I found the solution in Alcoholics Anonymous. I know how it works. It works by going to meetings. It works by talking to other people. It works by helping other alcoholics that are in trouble. And it works by by saying a prayer. And even if you don't believe in God or you're not sure about God, it doesn't matter. Believe in something bigger than yourself. Believe in something that you can rely on when you can't do it on your own. And that was the solution. And Alcoholics Anonymous has been the solution to my problem where I looked for the solution everywhere else. And believe me, I searched this world and I nearly lost my life on several occasions. Solution, believe me, is here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I will do it. I I love the meetings. I will do it one day at a time. And I trust and hope that I will do it for the rest of my life. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.